Hello everyone and welcome to today's Creative Connections, our hybrid future, a guide to flexible, remote and online working with Kate Larson. My name is Francis, and I'm delighted to be your host for today. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many countries throughout Australia and from where many of you are joining us today. I acknowledge um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the lands and waters upon which I am lucky enough to live, work and play here in Sydney. I pay my deep respects to their elders, past, present and future, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. If you'd like, I'd encourage you to share where you're joining us from today in the chat. So currently on slide, uh, on the screen now, is a blue PowerPoint slide with a gold semicircle in the top right corner. There's some gold, orange and white text and video boxes with our Auslan interpreter, Shavoy, and our guest speaker, Kate. I am a woman in my early 30s with fair skin, hair, blue eyes, and today wearing a light gray jumper. In the background is my living room. You can see some plants, my couch, and some artworks on the wall. These sessions have been designed and produced for you and explore the topics of leadership, digital, and arts practice adaptation. Thank you for continuing to join us live for these webinars. Um, and we hope that the recordings of the sessions are also proving to be a useful tool to refer back to as we navigate these changing times together. But before I hand over to Kate, I just wanted to bring your attention to some of the new grant opportunities that were launched at Australia Council last week. Applications are now open for three grant rounds, arts projects for individuals and groups for up to 50,000, arts projects for organisations up to 100,000 and fellowship grants to support professional development for up to two years. The closing date for these three rounds is the 1st of September. There's also a new translation fund for literature grant which supports international publishers in the translation of Australian works in creative writing and the applications for this close on the 24th of November. Uh, please check out our website for more information on these opportunities and uh, please share the word. We'll post the link in the chat now. So I know that many of you have attended uh, our webinars now, so you may be familiar with the housekeeping. Just so you know, live captioning is available via Zoom and can be toggled on or off uh, using the, cap the CC caption button below. As always, please use the chat feature to engage with each other throughout today share any links or any ideas that you have from today's webinar. Similarly, if you have a question, please use the Q&A tab rather than posting it in the chat, just so we don't lose it as we go through. And um, we'll be aiming to get through as many questions as we can throughout today. Today, we're joined by Shavoy and Kylie, who are Auslan interpreting throughout. Thank you both for being here. And finally, a recording of today's webinar with a transcript will be available after the session around mid next week which we'll send to you also by email uh, with the PowerPoint and any resources from today. So now on screen is a navy blue PowerPoint slide to introduce our guest speaker. There is a title to introduce Kate next to her headshot, a close up of a woman with fair skin, dark pulled back hair, wearing dark rimmed glasses and smiling at the camera. The image is shot in black and white and is in square cropped format. Kate is a non-profit and cultural consultant, arts manager, writer and trainer with more than 20 years experience in the non-profit government and arts sector here in Australia, Asia and in the UK. You may know Kate within her capacity of previous professional roles as director CEO of Writers Victoria or CEO of Arts Access Australia, which in 2012 she notably stepped down from because she didn't consider herself to be qualified for the job as a person without disability. As a result, Kate is a fierce advocate who continues to lead the way in creating greater access and equity within the arts. Today, Kate is here to help us unpack the tools and strategies to working effectively and uh, in remote and online environments, something that we've all become very accustomed to over the past four months. Kate will be covering planning, communication, protocols, and how to balance visibility with productivity, as well as access, digital inequity, and team wellbeing. Kate, thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing your thoughts and insights. I'll hand over to you now um, and I'll stop sharing my slides. 
Thanks so much, Kate. Thanks, Francis, and um, thanks everyone for having me. Welcome. Um, I'm Kate, and I'm speaking today from uh, Ghana country uh, in what is now known as Adelaide. I'm never more aware than when we come together to talk about arts and culture that we do so from the land of the oldest continuing living culture in the world. Um, it really is quite an extraordinary privilege to be part of that conversation and in particular um, with any of our First Nations colleagues joining us today. Uh, it's also a timely reminder that while we gather online, we do so from um, land for which sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, that's a reminder that comes with responsibilities, uh, both in terms of paying respect, uh, but also in terms of paying the rent, So, uh, which I will make a small contribution to uh, today, personally, by um, donating part of my fee for this session to Tandanya, uh, which is the National Aboriginal um, Cultural Institute uh, here in South Australia. Uh, as you know, this session is um, both Auslan interpreted and live captioned. I will also read or describe everything that I share on my screen. Uh, I'm a light-skinned woman in my mid-40s um, uh, with dark rimmed glasses and thanks to ISO haircut uh, techniques, much shorter hair than in my original uh, profile picture. Uh, I'm sitting in my home office uh, in front of a very plain white wall uh, and I'm wearing a polka dot jacket, uh, a Choose Art badge, uh, and bright red lipstick. I will also try to speak at a pace that's clear and accessible for everybody, uh, but when I um, speak in public, even uh, when that public is online, I do tend to speed up. Uh, so if I get overexcited and unintelligible, please feel to heckle me gently uh, in the chat. Um, I am really thrilled to be part of this connection, Creative Connections program for a number of reasons, uh, but one of them is specifically because um, uh, of the way it's provided our sector uh, with a working example of best practice digital access during this difficult time. Uh, so I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our access providers for today as uh, well as the Australia Council for meeting its obligations. Uh, but I'd also like to acknowledge our deaf, disabled and our regional colleagues uh, joining us um, who have been amongst uh, the uh, primary beneficiaries of the move to online and accessible arts delivery and workplaces that we're gonna be talking more about in this session. I would normally start a session like this by uh, acknowledging those who weren't able to join us for um, health or access reasons. So it's actually quite a joy to know that some of those um, barriers have been removed in making this an accessible digital program. And I do encourage the rest of you to live tweet or share anything that you find useful from today's session uh, for those who can't be with us. Uh, and yes, in answer to the question, this session will be recorded in order to help us do that. So COVID-19 has obviously plunged the world into online and remote working uh, faster than any of us could have imagined. Um, in addition to all of the headaches and the heartaches that that has caused and continues to cause, um, it has also immediately made um, art sector employment and engagement uh, more accessible, uh, more flexible, or even more possible um, for many. Though that has happened in a way that has been uh, frustrating for many um, deaf, disabled and regional people in particular, in that, um, and their allies, in which I include myself, in that the world suddenly got a whole lot more accessible the minute that city-based non-disabled people needed it to. Because it happened in such a rush, um, we also weren't able to be as strategic about those changes as we perhaps would have liked, um, which means that our, our digital workplaces and programs might be more accessible and flexible than they were, uh, but that doesn't yet mean that they're accessible enough. Um, or that they'll necessarily stay that way um, once we're all able to go back to our offices 
and venues. Um, even though I think it's worth taking a minute to reflect back, um, to, to think about that what our workplaces and in fact what the world has achieved in such a short um, period of time and in such difficult circumstances, um, in some ways is actually quite uh, incredible. Uh, conversations and processes that might have taken years before if they'd got off the ground in the first place um, were pretty much implemented overnight. Um, Organisations that never had um, even a work from home policy are now working entirely from home and communicating with other organisations doing exactly the same thing. It's not surprising then that has led to a lot of reverse engineering, a lot of working it out on the job. Uh, it's also not surprising that it's led to a lot of us getting things wrong. Um, but it's still completely revolutionised the way that we work in the arts in Australia, and that is pretty incredible. Also incredible is that all of the excuses that arts and other employers um, used to use to tell staff that we um, couldn't work from home, let alone from uh, a different town or state, um, were completely blown out of the water. Um, I've been asking around about um, the reasons that people have had uh, work from home requests uh, refused in the past. Uh, but as I read through my list, if you have any to add, please feel free to um, pop them in the chat. So they range from things like, uh, we just need you in the office with no further explanation given. Communications will suffer. Uh, we need to be able to talk in person. Uh, and the conversations at the water cooler help you be creative. To more technical excuses like um, the security of our data is too important. Um, our network won't support everyone accessing, accessing it directly, which is the big one that's since been tested and um, proved uh, to be, not be true. We can't control your health and safety at home for your insurance. Uh, it's just easier that way. Uh, or my favourite, uh, everyone will want to do it if we make an exception for you. Uh, I'm not saying that some of those things are obviously still harder uh, in a remote or online work environment, uh, but none of them um, turned out to be uh, the dead ends they were made out to be in the past. But while it's really great to have exploded some of those myths, um, to be fair, most of our experiences with remote and online working uh, over the past few months have been far from perfect. But my, from my discussions and uh, work around the sector, um, it feels like most of us are sitting somewhere uh, in the middle, uh, in that we've found both good and bad things uh, about working online. And when we start to break them down, uh, a lot of those bad things can either be blamed on the context that led to this uh, remote work revolution in the first place, uh, or the speed at which we had to put those remote work environments at place, rather than uh, the actual nature uh, of remote work itself. Uh, and that context is important. As a friend of mine in Adelaide said recently, um, everything is a lot right now. Um, so much is changing. Uh, it's changing really fast. Um, many of us are working from home for the very first time, uh, or at least working from home in different ways. Uh, some of us are reopening our offices while others are in the process of going back uh, or already back into lockdown. Um, when I first spoke to the Australia Council about this session, we had um, really hoped that we'd be able to focus entirely on what comes after lockdown, on new and hybrid ways of working moving forward. Um, but obviously some of you are now deep in shock and, and also in the weight of the disappointment of that still feeling quite uh, a long way away. And I'm really sorry for you, um, all of those of you who now feel, find yourselves at the brunt, at the pointy end of um, what was already a very challenging situation. We are, all of us, dealing with an extraordinary number of crises and changes all at the same time, and we are doing so while increasingly exhausted and fragile, um, 
and while cut off from many of the interactions that social, cultural, uh, creative interactions um, that ha that are important or have been important in the past for keeping us connected and happy and well. Everything is harder right now. Uh, the, remove, the move to remote working has also seen um, a huge increase in everybody's email traffic and in the amount of time we're spending in online meetings in particular, uh, which are more exhausting uh, than the meetings we used to have in, per in person, uh, both because um, we're all still learning about the differences and the different skills we need to do those meetings effectively, and because we have to work harder to both understand and be understood uh, when we lose the social clues of being in the same room with other people. On top of all that, as if that wasn't enough, situations and behaviours that might have been small issues before have been exacerbated um, now, as has how we deal with them personally and emotionally, um, and then doing so almost exclusively on the phone or online makes them that little bit harder again. This is so far from business as usual, but even if it's just a temporary new normal, it's definitely one we can improve, um, both by using this moment to revisit the logistics and the culture of remote workings, um, to find ways to make it better for those still working exclusively online, and to start um, for that new and hopefully better hybrid future, both on and offline. Um, before I go much further though, I'd like to know a bit more about where you're all sitting on that spectrum. So I'll ask you to take a look at the poll that um, is about to pop up on your screen and let me know where you fit on this scale, uh, which is whether you want to return to work on site in exactly the way you did before, uh, whether you want to return to work differently, maybe through a combination of on site and online, uh, or whether you want to keep um, working online. I'll give you all a minute to uh, think about that and I'll come back to the results uh, in a moment. Um, I'm not going to go uh, really into the technology side of that hybrid future today, uh, but more about how we use uh, that technology, which, which I think is just, if not more important as whatever platforms we end up using. Uh, by which I mean um, having a think about the logistics and the protocols and behaviours um, of managing our work and teams remotely uh, in ways that are not just effective, but hopefully also enjoyable. Uh, as we all know by now, uh, remote work isn't just an online version of our offline workplaces. Um, getting it right isn't as simple as copy and pasting our existing meeting schedules onto a different platform um, or even using different platforms to do exactly what we did before um, or even just something we have to put up with until the world goes back to normal. Remote work really is a discrete form of team and workload management. So it makes sense that it needs a discrete set of skills and behaviours to do well. Um, the exciting thing, the thing that I find most exciting, um, is that investing in those skills now can help our organisations uh, evolve and survive and thrive into the future, not just uh, during C19. Uh, let's see how our poll results have gone. If we can pop that up. Interestingly, we've had um, absolutely no one said they wanted to return uh, to work exactly um, the way they did before. 10% uh, of you say you want to keep working online and 90% of you say you want to return differently. It's a combination of on-site and online work, um, which is really consistent um, from the um, answers uh, and responses I'm seeing across all sectors. Um, it's really fascinating that as we start to move from, you know, what now feels like this interminable middle phase to a new, new normal, um, it's becoming clearer and clearer that we actually don't want to go back 
to the way it was before, um, which in many ways was less flexible, less accessible, and less productive in many cases, um, certainly less compatible with other areas of our lives. And, and online work and um, online working and um, online programs can also have other benefits, um, like obviously increasing our regional, national, international reach, uh, reaching more uh, non-traditional arts audiences in particular, uh, and potentially diversifying our income as a result, uh, as well as making our offices less crowded and more physically accessible if people, different people start working on different days, allowing us to recruit staff and board members from a much broader uh, area, including regionally and nationally and even um, starting to have an impact on reducing overhead costs. Uh, for example, if we start to shrink or share or sublet spaces um, that aren't needed when more people work at least partly from home. So how do we um, keep the things that we like uh, about remote working, uh, fix some of the things that we don't while we start to transition back into new hybrid workplaces uh, that work better for more people. I'm just gonna share my screen. Hopefully that's online now. Uh, sorry, one second, getting all of my chat boxes back online. There we go. Um, so on screen at the moment is a picture of a yellow highlighter, uh, which will be on every page. Uh, the title, of our, our hybrid future tip number one, take stock. It's also got my email address and social media handle, which I will read out in full at the end. So regardless of whether you're, you'll be staying online for a while longer, sorry about that. Um, regardless of whether you'll be staying online for a while longer um, or, uh, or already starting to transition back uh, to the office. It can be really helpful to uh, pause, to take stock, uh, to revisit the situation um, of where you are at the moment and where you can um, improve. Uh, by which I mean uh, checking in with your teams about how online working is going for them uh, and what they might need to um, make it better, particularly if it's going to last longer term. Um, asking them how they prefer uh, to continue working um, when they are in a position uh, to make a choice, which uh, similarly could include being totally on site, totally online, somewhere in the middle, uh, to give you uh, in the information you need to work out what you can um, and can't accommodate. Uh, talking about whether they need um, additional uh, equipment or support for hybrid work environments, um, such as having uh, work chairs or monitors in both locations, for example, rather than having to um, lug them back and forth uh, between the two or um, make themselves less comfortable uh, without them. Or things like matching them with a remote work buddy um, to, um, so they don't feel quite so cut off from office life. Uh, and importantly, if you're either continuing um, an online or hybrid work environment to think about, um, to not assume that all of your team have access to or can afford uh, the equipment or data that they need uh, to work at home. This um, issue of digital inequality is one that's been put in really sharp relief through C19, um, including through the Creative Connection session earlier this week from Martin and Jody at Access to Arts. Um, some of our team members are sharing devices or at the very least uh, fighting for bandwidth with other members of their households. Some may have um, previously used shared equipment that they don't have access to at the moment. Um, uh, some might simply not be able to afford the increase in their data plans, um, especially if their work hours have been reduced. Uh, and of course, there's more than 2 million Australians who aren't online at all. So as you have these conversations, um, be very clear about who's going to pay for what um, and try and make a safe and non-judgmental space so that people feel comfortable to tell you what they can uh, and they can't afford.
Tip number two is don't default. So once your team members start to split between home and office, it's also important um, not just to default to the way things were before. Uh, so this could include things like um, continuing to have staff meetings um, and external meetings online, even, of when, even when some of you are back on site. Um, so try to avoid slipping back into the habit of having team meetings in the boardroom um, and asking those who work from home to beam in, you, you know, which usually happens on a single screen for multiple people. Um, and instead ask your um, office space team members to dial in from their individual workplaces, um, which is more accessible, uh, it's more equitable, uh, it helps to support social distancing while we're still in a transition phase. Um, and it can really reduce that feeling of us versus them and um, hopefully mean that the work from homers um, are less likely to feel um, left out. Tip number three is meetings review. One of the questions I've been asked uh, a lot recently um, is whether we should be having more or fewer meetings um, when we work online as opposed to when we were in an office. Um, the answer to both confusingly and annoyingly um, is yes. Uh, so remote work requires us uh, to communicate more often, more effectively and in more and different ways. And online meetings are obviously an important part of that. Um, however, for some, some of us, taking time to review and reduce our existing meetings um, and think about new ones more strategically um, can help us make those meetings better, uh, can help us avoid meetings that happen uh, out of habit or meetings that happen simply because we don't uh, have um, time to think about doing them differently. Uh, the golden rule is, of course, that there is no golden rule, uh, but uh, we might want to take some time uh, to make some time uh, and aim for some of the, something like the list currently on screen. So fewer but better workload meetings, uh, fewer mandatory meetings. Um, many of us have put daily stand-ups in our team calendars um, which can be a really great way to stay connected and to you know, just observe how everyone's going. However, if we insist that they attend them, uh, we can actually reduce flexibility at a time when most of us need that flexibility more. Uh, more welfare check-ins, one-on-ones and uh, team social interactions, which uh, includes kind of formally uh, designing how we used to communicate informally, uh, and of course, more time to actually get work done. Uh, to reduce our meetings though, we have to first increase their quality, uh, which we can do so using um, the four areas now on screen as a kind of a filter to think about uh, firstly, being clear about our purpose. So asking, does the meeting need to happen? Uh, why, what is it that it needs to achieve? Um, trying to be very specific um, or specific as possible about what that purpose is um, and trying not to do too many things at once. And if we can't, if we struggle to articulate that clear purpose, thinking about whether we need to go ahead at all. Secondly, choosing the right platform, uh, which may or may not be a meeting. Third, streamlining the process. So if we do decide that an online meeting is the best way to go, uh, thinking about how we can make it better. So reducing the meeting time, for example, um, reducing the meeting frequency, uh, starting late and finishing early, but keeping the full period blocked out in your calendar to give you time to prepare and time to uh, follow up on actions afterwards. Creating clear agendas for your meetings with timings um, to make sure everybody is very clear about what it needs to achieve, um, why it's happening, uh, but also how um, participants will be expected 
to interact so that they can prepare and of course sending that out in advance. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, testing the premise, um, particularly around what will happen, what will need to happen if someone is unable to make that meeting. So asking ourselves, how will they catch up or contribute if they can't be there at the time? Uh, it's all well and good to be recording uh, all of our meetings or for somebody to be taking minutes, but when we're all busier than we've ever been, uh, does someone have the time uh, to read or watch that documentation? Um, or will you or the chairperson have the time to go around and update everybody uh, who wasn't able to be there? Tip number four is team interactions review. Uh, there are no shortcuts uh, when it comes to uh, remote workload and team management. Uh, and um, balancing the need to check in with our teams more often with the extra time that it takes um, those check-ins to happen, again, at the t while we're all busier than we've been in the past, means we have to be both more proactive and more strategic. So this includes finding time to check in with everyone individually and putting thought into the type of team and social interactions that can um, offset what we lose um, from those office-based interactions that, that have in the past kept us um, connected and informed, but also uh, are a key part of us, um, many of us enjoying our work. Um, so this could include some of the recommendations now up on the screen. So scheduling uh, recurring one-on-one -on -one video meetings with all of our direct reports. One-on-one um, -on -one time seems to be one of the biggest casualties of the move to remote working, uh, but it's really important. In fact, it's more important than ever. Um, it fosters trust relationships. Um, it makes our team members feel supported at a time when our pastoral care of them is heightened, not diminished. Um, and it gives them a safe space to share things that they might not be comfortable doing in those daily stand-ups or our other team meetings, um, which could just include an honest answer to how are you doing? Uh, and when I um, say this to uh, managers in particular, at the moment, a lot of people get very panicked, uh, look in their eyes about how um, are they gonna reincorporate uh, regular one-on-ones with all of their team members, but um, frequency is, is much less important than um, consistency here. So it might not be weekly meetings, it could be fortnightly or monthly or bi-monthly, whatever works in your particular situation. Um, it's just about making sure they're in the diary, um, as is making every effort not to cancel them. So postponing them is fine, but cancelling them, especially if it happens regularly, is a key way to build resentment and reduce productivity um, in the best of times. And as we know, everything is exacerbated in these not best of times. Uh, another tip is to focus on outcomes, not hours. So um, not being able to watch our teams at work um, often um, can make some managers doubt those teams. Um, that loss of visual, visual accountability uh, can um, usually unfairly, uh, in the most case, lead to a lack of trust, um, which in turn leads to micromanagement, which nobody's got time for. Um, so using that one-on-one -on -one time to try to uh, reset uh, workloads and expectations um, based on outcomes and goals rather than um, hours or days worked, um, and talking about how that could be measured in different ways, as opposed to just being visibly at work from nine to five or whatever. Uh, paying attention to who's contributing in group meetings um, is important. It's um, quite easy to show up without showing up at the moment, and that leads to people lurking in the background, um, feeling ignored. Um, so uh, a good trick is to um, keep a list of your team or the meeting attendees handy and just kind of tick people off when they speak, uh, which is a kind of a quick and easy way to see, uh, just to be able to tell who has and hasn't contributed and to call on them directly if anyone's lurking in the background. 
And finally, scheduling uh, team interactions that aren't about workload um, and being a bit uh, thoughtful and strategic about that to make sure uh, that people can contribute, um, participate in those regularly, uh, depending on those working days. So having a um, Friday afternoon virtual drinks is all well and good, but it means your Friday people who don't work on Friday uh, are going to always miss out. So um, setting up a social chat uh, on a text-based platform um, is a good way to keep people connected, uh, but to also it can help avoid keeping social non-work conversation out of those workload meetings to make those workload meetings more effective. Um, and scheduling um, virtual coffees or lunches or drinks or those kind of activities, um, but putting them on different days um, and times so that everyone has the opportunity to participate in them regularly, regardless of um, their working days. Um, uh, and asking team members to suggest their own uh, activities as well. Tip number five is online meeting protocols. Uh, this is another useful tool that we can put in place, uh, which is to agree amongst our teams some remote reading meeting protocols um, and asking them to use them when meeting internally or with external clients um, and even sharing them at the start of every meeting. So this could include some of the things uh, that uh, are currently listed on the screen. Uh, turning your video on if you can. Uh, using video is still super awkward. We all know this by now, uh, but it's important. Um, it helps keep us focused. Um, it helps us avoid multitasking uh, and it helps us read those nonverbal cues that I talked about earlier. So unless you have access or connection issues, um, do try to use video for as many and as much uh, of online videos, uh, online meetings as possible. That said, connection issues are real, uh, but it's tr good to try to at least start meetings with your video on, even if you don't end that way. Um, and access issues are real too, so, um, uh, which is why it's important to not make video use mandatory um, and to create a safe space where people aren't hassled if they don't, um, or aren't, don't feel comfortable or aren't in a position for access reasons to uh, use it. Uh, asking people to check their lighting and camera position, asking them to blur or use a background image, especially if they've got lots of activity going on behind them. Uh, obviously a background image that is work appropriate. Uh, if they have a comment or a question to use the raise your hand or Q&A function or write it in the chat box and to note your preference. Um, if it's difficult to keep an eye on more than one thing, uh, it's also reminded me, um, to thank that you've got some questions coming in uh, on the Q&A at the moment. Thank you for them, keep them coming and I'll get through them at the end of the session. Um, asking people to wait for the chairperson to call on them rather than speaking over each other, to speak directly to camera uh, and slightly slower than their usual pace, which is also a good reminder as I feel myself speeding up. Um, if they share their screen at any stage, to not assume that everybody can see or understand it. Uh, so to read out all written content, to describe the visual content, getting into that habit is also a helpful tool in encouraging people to make their slides and presentations simpler in the first place, which is also more accessible and user friendly for everyone. Uh, if connection issues occur, to act quickly, uh, trying to avoid uh, multitasking or more than that, being clear about uh, whether multitasking is or isn't appropriate uh, within the meeting. Uh, in some cases, like this one, uh, which is a low interaction uh, session, multitasking might be completely encouraged. And in fact, it might be the only way many of us are able to participate while doing several things at once. But uh, in our usual workload or external stakeholder meetings, um, it can make, multitask, multitasking can make those meetings less effective. It can make them longer. Uh, it can be distracting for others if they notice you doing it. And um, it can even lead to resentment or worse um, if that multitasking is seen as disrespect. Uh, also uh, be clear about 
uh, whether GIFs or side chat within the chat function is appropriate or, or not within um, your particular meeting. Um, for example, you might want to ask people to try to keep GIFs and chat, side chat off the chat until the end, or at least to between agenda items, if that side chat is an important part of encouraging team interaction and is something that people miss, keep it, but try and keep it controlled so the chairperson can at least keep track of questions coming through. Tip number six is online sharing protocols. Uh, many of us, uh, most of us possibly, uh, cringe at the thought um, of taking on the role and the control of a chairperson um, in online meetings, uh, but competent and confident chairing techniques are absolutely vital for effective online meetings, uh, and particularly when things go wrong. Uh, this could include uh, some of the things currently on screen, including being clear about how to manage your time and everyone else's, such as beginning each meeting with a summary of what you need it to achieve uh, and using that purpose to help you stick really closely to the timings on your agenda, pulling in the conversation when it goes off track um, and giving verbal warnings a few minutes before the end of each um, agenda time. Um, avoid visual warnings. You're seeing a lot of scissors and wind up signs happening in meetings at the moment, uh, but they're not accessible to everyone, including people who might be dialing in on the phone. Uh, manage turn taking, um, making sure everyone can contribute in meetings can be much harder online. Uh, so that um, can be managed by things like, like simply avoiding asking open questions like how do we all feel about that or does anyone have any updates, uh, which just leads to simultaneous answers and then the following awkward silence while everyone tries to decide who goes first. Um, and instead calling on people directly and as I mentioned, if you can keep a list of attendees handy so you can see who hasn't, hasn't contributed. Managing the chat and questions that we've talked about. Um, if you can't do it yourself while presenting, perhaps delegating it to somebody else to do so. Uh, managing tech issues, acting quickly when they occur. Uh, managing access issues similarly, such as if somebody's audio is too low or their background noise is too loud. If their device is causing problems, uh, if their connection is causing problems, if they need better lighting to be able to see and understand them. Um, similarly, it's important to call that out as quickly as possible um, to make sure that everyone else in the meeting um, can understand. Um, also avoiding a situation where somebody has to repeat themselves entirely because you didn't uh, tell them about the issue early enough. Um, and just make sure that everybody's access needs are being met. Um, that might also be um, feeling confident enough to mute someone manually if they don't get to it uh, quickly enough themselves. Uh, managing social moments if it's appropriate within the context and the purpose of your meeting. Um, and of course, managing difficult situations. Um, if the conversation gets off topic or out of control, um, addressing it as quickly and calmly as possible which you could do by parking the conversation to the end, um, asking to take that conversation offline, and of course, um, making sure to follow up. Um, or if things get really bad, actually just drawing a line, uh, particularly if the meeting is with multiple L or external stakeholders. This is where we need our fast and firm chairing techniques uh, more than ever to be very clear about what's appropriate uh, or not and cutting them off if you absolutely have to. It's also a good um, uh, lesson to remember um, when we set up our meetings to do so with a um, waiting room function um, turned on, uh, which means that if we do have to disconnect somebody that they can't automatically um, log back in. Tip number seven is different communication methods, um, which is another Easy tip to simply agree on using different ways of sharing information in any one meeting. Uh, we all have different ways of receiving, um, understanding or passing on information. 
Some people are more verbal, some more visual, uh, some prefer reading over listening, some prefer stories over facts, um, some communicate and work better in groups than on their own or vice versa or any combination of those. Um, the main things that we need to remember is that one size doesn't fit all. Uh, your preferred way of communicating might not work for someone else. In fact, it might be the, someone else's idea of uh, a nightmare. Um, and assuming that we are communicating clearly doesn't mean that we are. One of the things I found uh, most uh, fascinating recently is that a lot of our new remote and online meetings use predominantly oral uh, delivery. So someone speaking sometimes with video, sometimes not, to a group of people who are predominantly listening. Uh, but it's when you start asking people about their preferences um, and learning styles, it's actually really rare to find an oral only um, learner or communicator. Uh, so that feels like an easy fix that we can address this by simply asking people uh, what works for them. Um, using multiple ways of sharing information, um, not just speaking, be that visual aids, diagrams, video clips, PowerPoint slides, um, reading, writing, statistics, stories, um, group or independent exercises, um, maybe even physical exercises for kinesthetic learners, physical learners. Uh, trying to avoid voice only delivery um, or the only thing being on screen being a series of circles with people's initials on them, uh, not having any kind of visual reference um, uh, particularly for longer conversations um, makes it harder to concentrate on um, concentrate on and understand what's being said. Um, it's much harder to know how it's being received uh, and it's also much more exhausting for everyone. Uh, or again, going back to the meeting review process uh, and perhaps um, it, asking whether a meeting really is the best way to, um, to share that information at all. So I'm going to open up for questions in just a minute, but um, one of the things I've heard a lot um, over the last few months is that C19 has put a lot of our organisations in a real catch-22 situation uh, in that we're all too busy to think about what we need to do to become less busy, which brings us to tip number eight, co-design. Um, given the absolute whiplash pace of change at the moment. Uh, most of us don't have time to put a full uh, co-design process um, in place with our teams about how we should um, be communicating with each other and externally. But uh, remote work really is a process. It's not a fixed end point. We never reach uh, the finish line. Um, and the best remote work solutions are really are those that have been developed by teams working together to create plans and protocols that are specific to their situation. So keep talking to your teams uh, to co-design, update and evolve your online uh, communication protocols that work for, for you specifically. Maybe think about designating a remote work champion or champions who can make sure that those protocols are implemented. And keep talking about the challenges too of working and communicating online. Be open about the issues. Ask your teams for advice, crowdsource solutions together and um, uh, listen and respond. Um, it will get better than it is right now, I promise. Uh, and it might even get better than the way it was before. Uh, in case they're useful, I also have a, a series of free resources about remote and online workplaces in particular on my website at uh, larsenkeys.com.au, L-A-R-S-E-N-K-E-Y-S. -E -E uh, currently on screen is also my email address, kate at larsenkeys.com.au, and you can find me on social media at Kate Larson Keys. Uh, that's all from me, but I think we'll throw open for some questions. Great, thank you so much, Kate. Uh, that was a brilliant session, super practical, and I think um, those tips people will just be able to take away and hopefully implement into some of their workplaces. Um, I'll just quickly bring up my screen again. 
we've posted all of your details in the chat there as well so everyone can um, grab those out but we've had a couple of great questions come through so we'll just we're, we're running a little bit over but I think we should um, chat to them so the first question comes from Angela and she asks monitoring productivity is very difficult remotely especially when people are working flexi hours uh, to accommodate for caring responsibilities for children aging parents etc do you have any tips for accountability uh, in the context of working from home? I have never been more popular than I have been this morning. I'm very sorry for these continued interruptions. Um, yes, absolutely. So I guess the um, the trick is to try and find some, make sure that your flexible working policies uh, really are flexible, uh, and. Uh, by which I mean being very clear about um, uh, that concept of monitoring outcomes, not hours. So if, if right now uh, it's better for somebody to work from five till seven in the morning and then three till seven at night, if they are still achieving uh, the list of outcomes um, that you've agreed with them, does it really matter when in the day um, that happens? So, um, so yes, so I would go back to that and um, revisiting that take stock question uh, to work with everybody about what their uh, task outcomes are required on a weekly, monthly basis. However, um, you want to put that framework in place. Um, being clear perhaps about um, is there a common uh, time window when you expect people to be uh, online or available. Um, obviously, those who have reception or phone answering responsibilities um, uh, may need uh, to be uh, across um, different time zones. Uh, but is there a common time window for the team? Uh, perhaps also thinking about um, uh, what are expectations around response times to internal communications to external communications and being very um, clear about what those are and then sharing that information so um, putting on your email order reply to say my working thank you for your email my working hours are five to seven and um, three to seven in the evening I will respond uh, within three days um, or whatever it is that you agree uh, but just being clear about what it is and then sharing what it is. Yeah, great. And it's just that that over communication piece as well, just keeping in touch with your team. So it's one to ones. You're right. It's, it's really one of the first things to have dropped off. So keeping in touch with people for sure. We've had another question come in from Agnes um, who asks, one challenge I have found in remote working is training someone new to the organisation the inability to offer a guiding eye behind the shoulder advice instantly and um, understand the challenges experienced in the learning. I don't really have an answer to this one other than a mixed approach on site and online, but do you have any advice for new starters? Onboarding is, um, new starters is, is a really key challenge, both for those who, um, you know, started just uh, before uh, this digital revolution, but particularly for those who are being recruited now, uh, not just because of the formal management, but also um, they really uh, miss out on the the over the cubicle conversation, the um, asking question of their peers for whom they don't yet have um, relationships and at a comfort level to be able to ask those questions. So, um, so yes, it is it is challenging, um, but we can put some things in place to make that uh, a bit easier. So, for example, when somebody starts um, new in an organisation, taking time to e-introduce them in video meetings, uh, not just to the direct uh, their direct team, but to other key contacts within the organisation, um, setting up those uh, informal non-workload. Uh, opportunities so whether it's just we eat lunch together on Wednesdays and Fridays uh, for those who are available you know it's about strategically um, creating those uh, op what used to be opportunistic um, uh, op opportunistic uh, ways in which to build those relationships um, uh, as can matching um, people with a remote work buddy. So kind of giving people a one-on-one -on -one, um, peer to peer uh, relationship that's slightly more formalized um, than just saying, 
you know, they'll just talk amongst themselves, actually creating that strategically can give them someone to um, tap on the virtual shoulder uh, in a way that they, uh, it's harder to do outside of an office environment. That's, that's really great. That's great tips, actually. Um, we've, we've, all the questions coming through are really great. So we'll just take one more, I think, because we're running a little bit out of time. But this question is from Hugh Hu Lan, who asks, do you have any advice for people working in teams across different time zones? I find it really difficult to maintain sleep routines as part of self-care. Time zone is, uh, is a real issue and especially, um, you know, it's going to become more of an issue as more of us do take up the opportunity of recruiting from a broader field. Um, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, I'm assuming the sleep issue is um, from a much broader uh, time zone uh, differentiation than within Australia. Um, but one of the things is certainly is to talk to people about time, time zone bias. Uh, similar mm -hmm. to when we schedule uh, remote work drinks on a Friday, which um, means that our non-Friday workers um, miss out. Uh, a lot of meetings are set um, in a way that obviously biases one particular time zone over another. Uh, so thinking about how we can change regular meetings so different people are preferenced in different times can really help, um, really help with that. The other thing that we can think about encouraging with our organisations is that is to think about doing um, trying to do more asynchronous converse, uh, communication. So um, synchronous conversation is um, what happens when we are uh, having an immediate to and fro dialogue like phone, phone um, meetings or phone calls or water caller conversations. Um, you have instant input, you take that back and you continue. Asynchronous conversation is more like an email. So you send um, a query out, you wait for it uh, to come back in, but you don't have to stop working until that happens. Um, so that's, so lots of organisations who work across time zones and particularly those who work across large time zone areas really focus on that asynchronous communication. So how can we have this, instead of having a team meeting, how can we set up a shared, uh, shared drive document that asks the same questions and that people can contribute to uh, log in and contribute in their own time. It often also means that they contribute in better uh, because they have more time to think about it as well as it being more appropriate um, uh, and accessible for them to contribute when uh, they can. Totally. That you're, and that just speaks to your piece around uh, different learning styles and different ways of working as well. You know, it's just allowing different spaces for people to, to interact with those meetings. So thank you all so much for joining us. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but there's still some questions coming through. So if, if it's a burning question, and you still want um, Kate to answer it, please send it through to us at leadershipprogram at australiacouncil.gov.au and uh, we'll pass it on to Kate and aim to get back to you shortly. Um, but thank you again. Uh, before we go, I just wanted to quickly uh, run through what's happening next week on Creative Connections. So on Wednesday, we'll hear from George Liakis from Spark Strategy. He'll be talking to us about strategy through uncertainty. So that's next Wednesday at three. And then on Friday, we'll be joined by Dr. Carol Johnson uh, from the University of Melbourne and Melbourne Conservatorium of Music, Australia who will be encouraging us to consider if you can teach music online, then you're ready for pretty much anything. Uh, effective strategies for teaching music online. So if you're a musician or you're that way inclined, please join us for either of these sessions. And a quick reminder that if you haven't already done so, we'd love for you to fill out our midpoint survey just to see how we're tracking with these creative connections, whether you have any ideas of what we can do going forward. Um, we'll post that link in the chat now. But until next time, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much, Kate, uh, for the super practical session. I think people will get a lot out of this um, in the recordings as well. So thank you for being here. Um, to our Ausan interpreters, Kylie and Shavoy, to our live captioner, Marie, um, to my wonderful team working behind the scenes as well. And of course, thank you to all of you for being here. We hope to see you next time. Bye for now.